My name is Karen Oakham, and I'm a longtime journalist with the LGBT community. I started out at CBS News as a journalist in 1973, and then wound up in gay journalism in 1988 because of the AIDS crisis, actually. Nationally, you have Ronald Reagan, uh, who was the president. Anita Bryant was trying to mobilize across the country with Jerry Falwell and the Moral Majority. Dr. Uh, Michael Gottlieb and, and Joel Weissman uh, found that their uh, patients were coming down with this mysterious disease. It was reported in the New York Times first, which is why everybody thinks that New York had it first. When I was talking to this fellow who was uh, working at the STD clinic at the what was then called the Los Angeles Gay and Lesbian uh, Community Services Center, he said that in 1979, he had started seeing people with purple uh, blotches that turned out to be a, ca a Kaposi sarcoma. They would come in with a cold and disappear, and it turned out to be uh, pneumonia. That th It was the beginning of the AIDS crisis that we didn't really know anything about until 81. You know, I hear a lot of people talk about how AIDS activism uh, started in 1987 with ACT UP. That's not true. I can tell you, because I was kind of part of it in a way, that there was a lot of activism going on here on the ground uh, in Los Angeles. Connie Norman was a self-proclaimed AIDS diva and the first person I met who was transgender. And Connie Norman took me under her wing. She was the ACT UP LA communications person. People like Wayne Carr, for instance, and Corey Roberts, and people who were on the front lines and had whole lives separate and apart from their AIDS activism came alive because they were dying. And using anger as a motivator uh, to say, you know, we need to do something. The city of West Hollywood was one of the first to step forward to do things. John Heilman really deserves a lot of credit for this. He was one of the first people that uh, got involved with uh, promoting Stop AIDS. Uh, you know, we, uh, the city of West Hollywood sent some people up to San Francisco to learn what they were doing and bring that down here and make that operational as part of the government uh, in the city of West Hollywood. Uh, APLA started like in a closet in, in the Gay and Lesbian Center with people trying to help each other figure out what the hell was going on and just calm people's fears or just, you know, be a sort of a, a, a shoulder to cry on. Gay bars, which were f first very afraid to talk about AIDS, they started doing fundraisers. L.A. Shanti was another organization that was on Santa Monica Boulevard and they were sort of bereavement counseling, uh, especially end of life stuff. People don't really understand what we went through during that period of time, helping your friends die. At the time, there was no internet. So the way that that information got out uh, was by phone trees, actually. An event would happen and people would post flyers around the neighborhood. And also the gay press uh, was very important. That was critical for getting our information out. The Advocate started as, um, a, you know, as an extension of an organization called LA Pride, and it was all about putting out, you know, news and information about where the protests against the police would be held. I mean, that's how that started. We had to rely on our ourselves and each other. A local television station started uh, reporting on, on AIDS activism in particular as news stories. But prior to that, most of the news was uh, through cable, such as Out and About, Lesbian, Gay, West Hollywood, and people had their own little shows. Bill Rosendahl had a show um, on Century Cable that later became Adelphia. He was an executive there, and he he was really critical as well. He had, for instance, Michael Weinstein, who started out with AIDS Hospice uh, Foundation, and then it, that became AIDS Healthcare Foundation. 
and Michael would do regular appearances on Bill Rosendahl's show, uh, giving AIDS updates. And at that time, we didn't know how, we, oh, we knew that it was sexually transmitted, but you know, whether like a fleck of blood could get into my broken cuticle, I mean, there was always a fear, you know, because we didn't know. I think from my reporting and my personal experience that the thing we can be most proud of is how we reacted to each other, how we embraced each other, being in the spiritual vanguard. The government and religion, and in many cases our own families, turned their backs on us, shunned us, said we were going to hell, said we were evil, said we were no good, said we, we should be ashamed of ourselves. You know, we stopped and we stood up and we held our dying to our breasts and we said, I love you. I love you. And you are a worthy person and you are worthy of dignity. We belong here, we have a right here, and ours is a movement of love. And now people are seeing it when we talk about the right to love the one we love. That, that whole saying, that whole concept prior to marriage equality started with us during the AIDS crisis and what people have of future generations, people now need to understand is that all our dead friends live still within us. We promise never to forget, and we won't. That's what we bring. The right to love whom we love, it started with us, and I'm very proud of that.